Our next speaker is Mark Young, who um, is the senior geneticist at Beef and Lamb Gen Genetics. Mark assures me uh, that's nothing to do, not a reference to his age. He's also been in charge of SIL for the last six to eight years, how, um, approximately. So Mark is just going to talk about um, things and in, in, uh, the changes and improvements in Sheep Improvement Limited. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Neville. The, um, as Neville said earlier, we gave a report on the state of New Zealand sheep genetics and where SIL was at in 2009. So I want to move on and look at what's happened since then. We all know the national flocks decreased in size and we've also seen similar parallel changes in the animals that come onto SIL. There's fewer flocks and therefore fewer animals being added per year. Since that time we've revised some traits and the most notable one is the um, meat set of traits. We used to estimate weights of lean and weights of fat in the carcass and we've switched those to yields because there was some confusion in the industry about the difference between the growth effect and the composition effect. So we now have uh, BVs that are related to yields and that will be, may um, be seen in some of the figures I'm going to put up later for genetic trends. We've added some traits, we had a lot of the big easy to do traits so we've got DAG score and bear points and we've got some of the harder traits in our sites but we have added some since 2009. We've added accuracies for BVs and indexes. Um, there's some people who think accuracies are, are terribly important. They're fundamentally important to what we've just heard explained by Ken. If we're going to combine genomic information with estimated breeding values, you need to take account of the accuracies of both types of data. But if you know how bluff works, accuracies are built into the abrupt breeding values, so you don't necessarily need them to be able to make genetic progress if you select on BVs. Perhaps where they're more interesting is in the idea of risk. And then if you want a low risk situation, you go for high accuracy BVs, but there may be better BVs out there that have lower accuracy that you should be taking. And we've updated the economic weighting for, for traits, and that and some of the other changes we've made have brought some sort of issues to the fore in how breeders perceive the system is working. And the big thing is what Ken's just talked about, introducing those first generation genomic BVs, where they're a blend of the estimated BV coming from the traditional statistical genetics and these new MBVs, which are a function of estimating genetic merit from SNP information. So the scale, since 2009, we've increased the size of the database because we don't drop animals out of the database. But you can see there's fewer active flocks, 22%, although we haven't seen that same reduction in the number of animals coming on. So that large number of active flocks has got sort of three, uh, the change is three components. There were some flocks on SIL which data hadn't been added for several years and we try to clean those out every so often, but it's not uncommon for a flock to not add data for 15 months and then suddenly it catches up for various reasons of um, circumstances outside the contr our control. It's a case of smaller flocks being lost, and it's also a case of some of the remaining flocks increasing in size. So that's why you see that disparity between the changes in number of flocks and number of animals coming onto SIL. If we look at our largest evaluation, which is called SIL ACE, which we encourage people to participate in so that we can do across flock um, and across breed evaluations, that's increased since 2009 by some quite marked changes in the number of active flocks, but a more modest change in the number of animals. And you can see there that we've gone from being 38% of the SIL flocks to 59%, but it was only a very small increase from 61 to 63 for the percentage of SIL animals that are in that analysis from the latest birth cohort. So what that reflects is the fact that a lot of the larger flocks on SIL were already in SIL ACE, and the gains in flocks we've got have been more of the smaller flocks. So the changes we've got coming for the next few years We've had some concern that the way we represent information and the flexibility we allow breeders to have in doing that has caused confusion in industry by lots of indexes appear to have the same name or being used in a particular way, but when you look at the detail, they actually have different sets of BVs in that overall index merit, and in some cases, some breeders are adapting the uh, weightings on the indexes. So, a breeder may want to do that for their own breeding program, but it doesn't help us in the marketplace when they are different scales of merit. So we're going to be introducing some industry standard indexes for both our maternal or dual purpose sheep and our meat or our terminal sire sheep. As was foreshadowed by Eleanor's talk, we're introducing some BVs. One of them is U stability and the other one is U body condition score. 
We also want to look at how we can better characterise genetic merit in the meat or carcass merit area, and that's because some people as, have been observing that in their flocks, the high lean growth yield or high lean yield animals are sometimes the, the muscular animal they want, but sometimes they're also skinnier animals that haven't done so well. And the difference between those, if you and, um, look at how they've described it, is about shape. We also want to get away from having the on-demand um, evaluations for small groups of flocks where we have different combinations of flocks going into the BVs for different analyses to having a single all-cell evaluation. And this is a major undertaking to get a large enough um, data set through a BLUP type system. So we're going to be, our aim is to be able to do that on a weekly basis. Following that, we're going to introduce a system where we don't have the blending system that Ken's described, where we merge the MBVs and the EBVs, and we go straight to a GBV, or genomic BV, by combining the information on pedigree, on performance, and the DNA, all in one meta-analysis. So the, these two points here are saying we're going to set up an evaluation system like we currently have, but for all of SIL, and the next step beyond that is to actually have the DNA brought into that evaluation as well. So I want to now look at some industry genetic trends. And what we've got here is um, genetic merit in terms of cents per lamb born. And we can see here in the dual purpose or maternal sheep, we've got about $15 worth of gain since 1995. The figure for the terminal size is about $8, and that's lower because there's a smaller set of traits, and some of the traits in the dual purpose line are worth a lot more, things like number of lambs born. If I'm using a terminal sire ram, I don't uh, get any value from the reproductive potential of his daughters because they all go off to slaughter as a commercial farmer. If we look at some of the components of that, we can see a very steady increase in the number of lambs born. And to take uh, a leaf out of Lee's book, this is when I started with SIL, 2001. <laughs> I suspect the groundwork was laid by people who had the system designed, and all I did was hop onto the train as it gathered speed. But you can see there that there's a very steady increase, and it's quite marked that, that kink at 2001, and that coincides with a, a different BLUP model and a different way of using the data that was available for reproduction, and it's absolutely marked that a lot of the gain we've got here in reproduction is due to a better analysis model at that, introduced at that time. For lamb growth, we can see that the terminal sires have a slight advantage here, and that's not surprising because it's a, a, a bigger proportion of the index with an index having fewer traits. It's also a defining trait of terminal sire sheep. You want fast-growing lambs. If we look at ewe body weight, this is a bit more of an interesting one. There's a bit of a kink here. And this kink in 2003 coincides with a period where we were advocating people begin to collect adult live weight data, um, more of it. And so we're now getting a better feel for where adult live weight is relative to lamb growth. What I want to do now is just combine that lamb growth and this ewe body weight onto one graph by looking at the economic index components. And so the economic con comp um, index for combining lamb growth and ewe size is this blue line. And that's composed of the black line, which is the reward for lamb growth, and the green line, which is a penalty for, for ewe size. And this tells me that we've got the economics about right. And this is, uh, this is a vexatious issue for some of our breeders. They're saying we think you might not have it right. And so what we've got here is a situation where animals with great growth potential on our current system will always get a higher index, or should get a higher index. But there is a penalty there for use size, so we've got an element of profit there. And when it comes to actual profit of the greater system, what we really need to do is make sure we've got all of the traits in as well as fine-tuning some of these relationships. When it comes to carcass lean yield, the meat sheep have made much more progress. You can see here quite a marked increase. Now, the units here are kilograms of tissue, a standardised 18-kilogram carcass, so they've got 200 grams more lean tissue after this gain, which really kicked in about 2001. Now, the, the terminal so, uh, dual purpose were tracking down and then showing a little spurt upwards. You could say they haven't made much change, but this is the point here where we started to brought in these new BVs where we were looking, rather than lean weight, we were looking at lean yield. So up until this point, breeders were seeing changes and increases in lean weight that weren't keeping up with the changes in carcass size. So they were getting heavy, more lean from a much bigger carcass, which is a lower lean yield. 
The commensurate figures for fat yield here show that, the, once again, the terminal size have shown a much more marked effect, and that more marked effect is simply that sort of two sides of a coin. If you've got more yield, you've got less of something else. And some people would argue that lean yield is actually about lower fat yield, because you, you, it's a trade-off as to which tissue you've got. The more modest changes down for carcass fat yield are an interesting one, because we're now starting to see um, look at whether how, what the value of body condition score is to a U relative to the penalties that ca have been applied for carcass fat in lambs, and some breeders have been voluntarily using their figures to avoid selecting very low fat yield animals in their maternal breeds. So looking to the future, we want to better describe genetic merit, and there's several things we want to focus on. One is to have these simple, relevant, and standard de descriptions of merit. We've had quite a sophisticated system, and that's viewed by a number of people in the industry as being complicated. So we want to try and make it simpler. <coughs> we want to add in key traits that are currently missing. The, two, the three I mentioned were stability, body condition score, both attributes of the maternal ewe, and also muscularity in the meat um, traits. We need to put more focus on data quality. There's quite variable um, quality of data on SIL, and we can lift the accuracies by put, making that a, a stronger um, focus. And we want to remove the confusion associated with multiple sets of BVs for animals by having one standard evaluation across industry. The other thing we want to do is make better use of genetic information. And so to do that, we want to get easier access to it. And we're setting up data structures that third-party applications can access easily. It'd be good to be able to say, here's an animal that's in front of me. I've got, it's got an EID. If I want it, can the smart device in my pocket tell me something about that animal by connecting to some database? And we also want to say, with all these clever systems we've got for estimating genetic merit, we actually want to align those with what the outcomes are on farm to better inform future um, breeding decisions. So we want to look at the relationship between the scales of genetic merit and what happens on farm. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. As I said, Mark has to leave immediately after his talk. So um, if you don't ask Mark, I'll probably have to answer it. So please, I'll allow plenty of time for um, any questions now for Mark. Mark, is um, pedigree easily accessible directly out of sill to the um, Breeders. Can I, Mark, could you repeat the question just sure. the... Sure. Um is, is pedigree information easily available to the breeders? The, the way the current SIL system is set up, it is not easily available, but there are tools online for the SIL ACE data set. We um, release, uh, people have, there's a search engine that can search for individual animals, so you could put an animal ID in and find out who its parents were. It will tell you that online. Peter? Mark, you commented that you felt that the, um, the penalty on new weight was about right, yet the genetic trend is trending upwards quite dramatically in the last few years. Are you really sure that we've got that right? Or that yeah, I, I, that right? I, it might have been misspoken there. I'm trusting the experts of which um, resides in your company, the expertise on estimating the economics of the farming system is representing things well, and we aren't trying to drive down new weight, as some people claim. Mm. John. Um, Lee described for their beef calves, um, for, for the sellers of the beef calves, um, a situation whereby that they, um, they could be rewarded for their better genetics um, at point of sale in terms of um, um, the price they receive. At the moment, um, a lot of our store stock is, is, is not even, um, especially for sheep, doesn't even go across the scales. Um, is there, do you think there's, this could be developed as something like that, so that if, if, um, if I'm using um, rams of high genetic merit and my store stock are, are going to do a hell of a lot better in terms of converting grass into meat quicker, um, that um, in selling them I might be able to be better do, do people over in this far corner want me to repeat that? Or do you got it? The, the camera does. The, the camera wants you to repeat it. So the question is, based on Lee Leachman's talk earlier, is there a system in New Zealand where, with sheep, we could um, certify or um, rate store animals being sold for their future genetic potential? 
as for, for to buying and for finishing them or as, as replacement use on a commercial farm? Um, the answer is yes, it could be done. I noticed and noted in Lee's talk that it was a, a third party company that was doing that certification and that's a, a degree of independence is, is, a, is a good thing and I think also that the um, DNA technologies we have got now are ways you can sort of do some checking and, and validation of some of these things. Are the genetics that you say you've got, the piece of paper got, the genetics that um, should be um, where they're inside those animals? John? Uh, given Lee's earlier talk around feed efficiency, um, is it time New Zealand sheep industry moved past just conveying sheep that's using a proxy for intake? Intake. If you'd asked me before Lee's talk, I'd have been more cautious. But based on his talk, I would say it, it, it looks like there's potentially an opportunity there, John, yes. And as John, it's a slightly leading question. John knows that um, the Ag Research Group have got a, a experimental feed intake facility and we're wanting to be putting animals through it. So <laughs> we're not doing nothing, but. <laughs> You're asking for how much impetus there should be, are you? It's an interesting question, isn't it, that's coming from mm. farmers, I think. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I just, as a biologist, I'm trying to think, what is it the animals are doing differently that one has to eat, you know, four times as much as the other to do the same thing? That's, I find that fascinating. Any more questions? Okay, what do you think, uh, Mark? Thank you. Megan?